Last week, we looked at the rapture. Our one-sentence description went like this. The rapture is a term we use to signify a future point in time when Jesus comes down from heaven to remove his church from the earth to meet him in the air. The seminal verses for the rapture doctrine are 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, Hamasunatos Harpazo and Nephele will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. As you know, the New Testament was written in Greek. The Greek word harpazo means to seize, to carry off, to snatch out or snatch away. And from that Greek word, we get the Latin word rapturo. And from that, we get the English word rapture, the name given to this doctrine. If you weren't here and would like to hear the whole sermon, you can go to the YouTube channel, Hooter1100, go to the Facebook page under our name, or you can just ask for a CD and you can listen to it in your car or your boombox. Maybe there's somebody else you would like to give a copy to, so just be sure to ask. There's a list of our sermons on the bulletin board. Now, as I stated last week, and I'll say again, there are many godly Christians who see the rapture occurring at different times. Most evangelicals today see a pre-tribulation rapture, dispensational premillennialism. Others see a mid-trib or post-trib rapture. But in the big picture, the timing of the rapture is not something that should divide fellow Christians. No matter when it happens, we are told to be ready, to live our lives as if it will happen in the next few moments. One thing for sure, it will happen without warning. And the Bible does not tell us of anything that needs to happen or take place before these events occur. And as I said, I believe the Scripture points to pre-tribulation rapture for the reasons we discussed Last week, especially because of verses like Revelation 3.10, where Jesus was talking to the church, the faithful church. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on this earth. That verse does not say that Jesus will protect us in that hour or that he will protect us during that hour. It says he will keep us from that hour. Sort of like not having the right ticket will keep you from seeing the Super Bowl. You won't be there in person when Tony Romo throws an interception to lose the Super Bowl. You won't be there to feel the pain. <laughs> Concerning the tribulation, not having a front row seat is a good thing. Instead, we have a ticket from heaven, which will keep us from the rapture and that hour of trial that is coming upon the whole world. That is the view of many. Furthermore, since this hour of trial... If we take it, what it says, will come upon the whole world, meaning everyone in it, just as for God so loved the whole world, meaning everyone in it, but will come upon the whole world, and by definition, would have to come also to those of us in the church if we were still on the earth. But since 1 Thessalonians 5 9 says, for God has not destined us for wrath, us being the church. I believe that we will all be removed from the earth prior to God's pouring out his wrath upon those who dwell on the earth. No matter the timing, a Christian should constantly be aware of the imminent return of Christ and should live so that he or she 
will not be embarrassed or ashamed when Christ comes for us. What will you be doing when he comes? I hope he does not find you in a Las Vegas casino with the cold one in your hand. Las Vegas is America's Corinth. If that happens, it'll be like what Ricky Ricardo asked Lucy. Lucy, what do you have to say for yourself? A lot of people thought he said, Lucy, you got some splaining to do. Now, he did use the word splaining, but not in that phraseology. He never once said that, but he did say, Lucy, what have you got to say for yourself? Another reason I believe the rapture is pre-tribulational is Matthew 24, 30 through 31, which is talking about the second coming. Then will appear in heaven a sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to another. The First Thessalonians 4 rapture verses don't say anything about signs of the Son of the Man or that all the tribes on earth will mourn and see him. But in the Matthew second coming verses, it does say all of that. Also in the Matthew verses, verse 31 says that Jesus sends out his angels to gather his elect. In 1 Thessalonians, it does not say anything about angels doing the gathering Instead, it says that the Lord himself will descend from heaven and we will be caught up with him along with the dead in Christ to meet him in the air. Notice also at the second coming, it says the angels will gather the elect from the four winds, meaning from every direction, and from one end of heaven to the other. I believe that those who are gathered from heaven includes those of us in the church that are already there that have been raptured prior to that moment now what follows the rapture my belief which should be perfectly clear by now is that the tribulation period follows the rapture of the church as stated earlier i'm not alone in this belief but once again there are others godly christians who see it differently and they offer a very thoughtful polemic a polemic is an argument against a certain stance Ultimately, it's up to you to read and study the Bible for yourself and come to your own conclusion. But your conclusion must be based on an honest assessment and an honest interpretation of what the Bible actually says and not what you want it to say. There's lots of things the Bible says I wished it didn't say, but it does. We won't go there. Now, I'm not going to keep constantly reminding you that others have a different interpretation than the one I present. I may throw in little reminders on occasion, but I'm going to concentrate on what I have learned from the many commentaries and studies that I've read, the prayer and the Bible that I read, and what I believe to be true. And my interpretations are not far-fetched ideas that I thought up. And I gave a short list last week of some of those who are in agreement. Brother, I'm in agreement with them because they were first. But I won't go over that today. But rest assured, I will never, never try to teach you something that I know to be wrong just to achieve some personal goal. Neither will I twist the scriptures to fit what I think you want to hear just to keep you coming back. My constant prayer, my constant prayer when I'm reading, writing, and studying is that God will lead me into preaching the truth according to the Scripture no matter what toes get stepped on. But I will never knowingly lead you astray to build a personal empire or to have my way. Following the rapture, will be a period of seven years that is called the tribulation. It will be divided into two parts, the tribulation and the great tribulation. It will be a time of great trouble and prosecution and persecution, and it will culminate with the second coming of Jesus Christ back to the earth and the Mount of Olives. That is what many call the day of the Lord. 
Now the day of the Lord is not the same as the Lord's day. And we will discuss that in a moment. Before we go any further, I want to try to explain something first regarding the word day. The word day can be used and be understood in different ways depending upon the context. It could mean an extended period of time, such as like saying, back in Jim's day, they still drove horses and buggies. In that case, the word day refers to all the days of Jim's youth. Another example would be back in his day, Hank Thompson ruled the jukeboxes. His day refers to all the days and years Hank Thompson was in his prime and was selling lots of records like, My Tears Have Washed, I Love You from the Blackboard of My Heart. What a song. But we normally use day to indicate a single 24-hour period as I remember the day, Trevor, I got my first car. Hint, hint. In that case, you are talking about a single specific day out of the many that you have lived. Or, I don't remember on which day I got married. Again, you're talking about a singular 24-hour day in a calendar period. Mine was always the 24th, by the way. I do remember that. <laughs> she probably forgot. <laughs> yeah, it was. John Deere went by only in Texas. Oh, boy. The ancient Egyptians are credited with first dividing the day into two 12-hour periods, giving us the 24-hour day. They based their 12 hours on the 12 hours of daylight and the 12 hours of darkness that occurred on the equinoxes, spring and fall, equal daylight, equal night. That's where they come up with the 12. Today, we count using our fingers and thumbs, fingers and thumbs. That gives us 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Jim, being a mathematician, he uses his toes as well, and he can count all the way to 20. He can go all the way to 20. The Egyptians, however, are thought to have used their knuckles on their fingers, which gives you 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I use my knuckles to figure out how many days, I mean, how many days in a month. January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August. The knuckles are 31 days and the valleys are 30 or 28 and 29. But anyway, it works, it's true. When it's July and then you go back to another knuckle, July and August have two 31 days. 12 is more easily divided into smaller units than 10 is divided. Both can be divided in half. 12 divided by 2 is 6, 10 by 2 is 5. But 12 divided by 6 equals 2, whereas 10 divided by 6 equals 6.1666. Now, don't read anything into the 666. It just worked that way. 12 divided into four equal parts gives you three, whereas 10 divided by four gives you two and a half. 12 divided by three equals four. 10 divided by three gives you 3.333, and so on. So 12 made a lot of sense to the Egyptians 2,000 years before Christ, and that's what we still have to this day. You can divide the day into as many units as you want, which in our case is 24 60-minute hours. But if you drove a stake in the ground and created a sundial, each day would be just as long as the other. The sh shadow would travel at the same speed, and the day-night period would be the same amount of time, no matter how many increments you divided it into. We could have 48 30-minute hours if we so chose. But one complete 360-degree revolution equals one day. And no matter how much the length of daylight and dark changes with the seasons, the length of each total day remains the same. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. 
Genesis 1.14. So it is to this day that the sun and the moon and the stars mark the days and the hours and the years and the seasons. Fall always follows summer and spring always follows winter. The times and seasons do not change and neither does our God change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now listen to me carefully. I am not at this time using what I have just said to quantify the days of creation as to their length. There are differing views on that subject matter, which we will not discuss here today. We had a very lively discussion about that Wednesday. Boy, if you can make it to Wednesday night, I do suggest it, like Becky had said. And I will say this. It is one of the subjects that should not come between fellow Christians. I personally believe that God created the earth in six days, in six 24-hour periods. Others see it differently. That's fine. What you believe about God's creation methods has no bearing on whether or not you believe that His Son, Jesus Christ, died for our sins. Now, if you denied the cross, that would be a bone of contention. I am simply saying that in the beginning, God created the sun, the moon, and the stars by which we can divide and determine the days, the months, the years, and the seasons. Now then, back to what we call the Lord's Day. It is the first day of the week, and is the day in which Christ arose from the dead. We know this based on the biblical record of Christ's death and resurrection in relation to the Jewish Sabbath day, which is from sunset on Friday to sunset on Saturday. Most Christians observe Sunday as a day of worship rather than a so-called Sabbath day. Sabbath day was a part of the old Mosaic law system, and Christ changed all of that. I say most because there are some Christians, like our Seventh-day Adventist neighbors here in Keene, who continue to observe a Sabbath day. They are also called Sabbath keepers. It's about all of them I know. But Furthermore, the Lord's Day is for Christians only. And because it is, our democratic republic is not able and should not even try to pass legislation concerning that day. You seasoned citizens may remember the old blue laws. I do. Boy, they did not make sense, but I remember them. Religious laws do not work outside of a theocracy. They were no doubt, the blue laws were no doubt a sincere effort by some politicians to observe Sunday as a holy day. But it were more closely related to the Mosaic law than to Christianity. Valiant effort just doesn't work and it doesn't apply. Meeting together on Sunday to worship God is a tradition started by the very first churches. Turn with me to Acts 20, verse 7. We've got to have a little Bible drill thrown in. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Chapter Acts 2, Acts chapter 2 is when the church got started, when the Holy Spirit was sent. But we're going to go to chapter 20 in Acts. Love to hear the rustling of them pages. That is God's Word, written Word. Acts 20, chapter, I mean, verse 7. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. Hmm. Talked until midnight, and you think my sermons are long. But notice it says on the first day. That indicates they were meeting on Sunday, all the way back in the first century. Now turn to Revelation chapter 1, last book in the Bible, Revelation 1. There is no S in Revelations, by the way. Revelation. It was a revelation given to John. Chapter 1. John is stranded on the island of Patmos. And Jesus Christ came and gave him a vision. That's why in some Bibles you'll see some words written in red. They're the words of Christ. Verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. 
And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. There's the affirmation of the name we use for Sunday. Sunday is the Lord's day in our Christian lives. The early churches met on the first day of the week because it was on that day that Christ arose from the dead. But there is nothing in the Bible that says it has to be on that day, nor does the Bible teach any special conduct or ritual behavior for Sundays. We are no longer under the law. Paul said in Romans 14, 5, 6a, One person esteems one day is better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be, careful, be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. In other words, you can worship the Lord on any day of the week and you would do well to worship Him every day of the week. That is very different than a Sabbath day prescribed by law. But the precedent for formal worship on Sundays was set by the church in the first century and Sunday worship, church worship, should have priority over all other activities like mowing the lawn. You have six days to do that. Unfortunately, the world disagrees and continues to schedule uh, secular events for Sunday mornings like Super Bowls and races and, and all these other things that they continue on the Lord's, that they schedule on the Lord's Day. Let your conscience be your guide. Church attendance is not mandatory. It is recommended, Hebrews 10, 25, let us not give up meeting together as is the habit of some. It is not mandatory, so all that I ask is you try to be here when you can. Just remember that God is more important than anything else in this world. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now then, let's move from the Lord's day to the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is a term that is used to designate a day of judgment from God. There are many days of judgment or periods of judgment in the Old Testament, especially against Israel. For example, one day or period of judgment against the nation of Israel was the Babylonian exile, which lasted 70 years. This is why I explained a while ago that day can be used to mean a single day or a period of time. I was not trying to waste your time with that. The day of judgment came upon Israel and they were exiled for 70 years. Another major occurrence of a day of judgment against the whole world is seen in the Old Testament account of the worldwide flood of Noah's day. The first world order created by God in the beginning, was destroyed by water during the days of Noah. In that first world order, humans were vegetarians. There was no rain. People lived to be 900 years old or older, Methuselah, 969 years. It was a very different world than the world in which we now live and the one that followed the flood. But that first world order was judged and completely wiped out, save for eight people and the representative animals, Noah and his wife and his sons, Sham, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. But it was completely wiped out. The second world order, which began after the flood in which we now live, is being stored up to be destroyed by fire. God made an oath that he would never again destroy the earth by water and he set his bow in the sky as a reminder. Though we're getting lots of rain, though we've had tsunamis, he will never again. Genesis 9, 11 through 13. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all 
future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Now concerning the final judgment of this second world order. You know, if you watch the news like I do and listen to the world leaders, you hear a lot about a new world order and all this stuff. But theirs is based on man. It's their arrogance to think that they can create a new world order. Only the intervention of God in this world will create a new world order. But turn with me again to 2 Peter 3.10. The little epistle of Peter, 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 10. 310. Actually, it's uh, 1150, but 2 Peter 310. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. You see, the world as we know it will be burned up. The NIV translation says it will be destroyed by fire. The King James says the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Malachi 4.1, Old Testament says, Behold, the day is coming burning like an oven when all the arrogant and all evil doers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. This world will be burned up someday. The ultimate day of the Lord and the one that we refer to the most, which is usually meant by that phrase, refers to a future day or days of judgment whereby God judges the entire earth and ends this world system in its present form. Some see the day of the Lord as that singular day in which the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to earth with his army. And I believe that includes us. One single 24-hour period in which Jesus comes to rescue his people and destroy their enemies. Others see the day of the Lord as an extended period of time, like we've discussed, and that includes all of the judgments contained within the seven-year tribulation period, such as the seven seals and the seven bowls of judgment, and also includes Christ's reign on earth, his millennial reign. I personally am comfortable looking at it both ways. And I am not ready to make a declaration as to whether it includes just one day or many days. I am very comfortable thinking that the day of the Lord will include all of the judgments in the millennial king. Because man's world, the time of the Gentiles, will end. And Christ will take over and reign and pass judgment on this earth. So if we include all of that in the day of the Lord, that's fine by me. And the, the day of the Lord will be the day he sets foot back on earth. So either way you look at it. I don't believe it is necessary to pinpoint an exact moment in time that constitutes the day of the Lord. But we do know that the day of the Lord is coming. And that will, it will be a time of judgment on the earth. Now, at the end of the earthly millennial period of Christ's reign on earth, well, he will rule from David's throne in the holy city of Jerusalem, will become the third world order, which is eternity, and will include a new heaven and a new earth. Peter refers to this as the day of God. Different words. Again, the apostle John writing in the book of Revelation then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first, first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, 
Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. What a glorious day that will be. Future prophecy and end time events which fall under the theological classification of eschatology are sometimes hard to understand, maybe even impossible. Even the Old Testament prophets could not always understand their own visions that God had given to them. The prophet Daniel was given a vision concerning the end times. Just note the verses and I'll read them. Daniel 8, verse 15 and 17. When I, Daniel, the great prophet Daniel, who wrote about the 70 weeks, had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. He saw the vision and he was trying to understand it. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. So he came near where I stood and he came. I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. The vision that he's seen was of the end times. Now verses 26 and 27 of Daniel 8. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true. But seal up the vision, for it refers to many days from now. And I... Daniel was overcome and lay sick for some days. Then I rose and went about the king's business, but I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. Daniel was so confused by the vision of the future that it made him sick for days. And if he was given the vision by God and made him sick and he couldn't understand it, the date setters and all those folks that claim they do in such minute detail are wrong. They're committing sin, by the way, too. We have much more history to go on than the Old, Prof Old Testament prophets did, plus we have the New Testament. But we still don't see things clearly. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully even as I have been fully known. That's Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, 12. We see in a mirror dimly, but then we'll see face to face and we will know. But know this, the day of the Lord will be a day of fury and wrath, a day of darkness and sorrow. There will be suffering and death. It will be a cataclysmic event. Read Revelation and the seven seals and the seven bowls and the horsemen of the apocalypse. You don't want to be there. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, come gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and save, slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. That would be Christ and his followers. And the beast was captured and with it the false prophet who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast, 666. And we don't know exactly how that will work out. But the Bible tells us it's 666. And those who worshipped its image, the image of the beast. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. If you do not believe that there's a hell burning with fire, this is one of the many verses that confirm it. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from his mouth who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Revelation 19, 17 through 21. 
We do not know when that day will come. Jesus himself did not know. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will the coming of Son of Man be. Matthew 24, 36 and 37. And know also that the day of the Lord, like his coming in the clouds to receive his church, will come like a thief in the night. If you want to, turn quickly to 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 and 11. That way you can lay your own eyeballs on it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 and 11. Over there. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there's peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or the darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and a helmet of hope for salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that who, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another just as you are doing. Therein is our application for today. Let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet of hope for salvation. That means we are to live our lives in expectation of His coming. God did not reveal everything to us that every, so that every generation would live in the light of the reality that these events could occur at any moment. Paul certainly expected them to occur in his day, during his lifetime. But with the Lord one day is a thousand years and a thousand days as one year. 2 Peter 3.8 God lives outside of time. Time means nothing to him before he invented the cosmos. There was no time. So to him, Jesus' death on the cross was like a couple days ago. Remember also Peter says he's being patient so that all of those that he has called to salvation will be called to salvation. But someday the time of the Gentiles will be complete and Christ will come again. Paul said we have no need to know the times and the seasons because we are not in darkness. We know that the day is coming. And that is all we need to know. We should not be caught off guard. In other words, stay out of that casino. <laughs> he won't have to ask, what were you thinking? We need not be concerned with date setting and predictions. Like Harold Camping. God is not destined us for wrath, so why worry so much about it when we have heaven to look forward to? As for your future and your family, plan as if that day was a long way off. But live your life as though it might occur at any moment. It just might. It just might.